So many Roman Catholics will say, no, 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 don't misunderstand us. We don't mean he walks around and everything he does is infallible, God forbid. And here is a, a, a from, uh, uh, I think it's Catholic Answers, there is a correcting mis misconceptions on papal infallibility. You see in the middle of the screen here. Infallibility, they say, is only conferred on papal pronouncements which are solemnly and dogmatically defined and does not apply to remarks made by the Pope as a private individual or even as a priest or the Bishop of Rome or the Pope, etc. Only when he speaks as the Pope ex cathedra, literally from the chair, meaning that he is formally defining something as infallible, is infallibility invoked. Such instances are very rare indeed, far rarer than many non-Catholics think. So this apparently is an attempt to say, hey, don't worry too much about this teaching that is really offensive to you because it doesn't really happen that often. And it's only in this really rare thing and it's really special. But unfortunately, that doesn't save it because if it happens once and never happens again, it's still an offensive teaching to the extreme. And let's hear Saint Eustine Bobovich who has written on this in a most powerful way. In two slides, let's hear what he has to say. This is from the Orthodox Church and Ecumenism. What's wrong with this infallibility idea? Why is it not able to be reconciled with the theanthropic, uh, incarnational uh, uh, teaching and reality of the, of the Church of God? It's impossible to reconcile these things. Because we, we depart from uh, God, hu God humanity, and we, we're simply now in the realm of humanism. Let's hear what uh, St. Eustine has to say. There's no place for the God-man here. There's no place for the theanthropos, right? God-man here. For this reason, in the humanistic kingdom, the place of Christ, the God-man, is now taken by the Vicarios Christi. And the God-man is banished to heaven. This is surely a kind of de-incarnation of Christ, the God-man. De-incarnation of Christ. St. Eustine, by the way, one of the greatest dogmatic theologians in the Orthodox Church of the 20th century, if not the greatest. Uh, he produced numerable texts. One of them is this massive tome uh, right there. You can see it. It's, a, it's in Greek. Let's see if we can get that on the screen. That is St. Eustine's dogmatic theology. And unfortunately, it doesn't exist in English yet. This is a thousand fifty pages of unbelievable wisdom and insight. So St. Eustine is coming here and saying that the whole theology at the heart of the church, which is the incarnation and the theanthropos, this is a de-incarnation of this. Right? No more, there's no more understanding here of the synergy of the body of Christ, the people of God with Christ. We now have a human who has this charism, supernaturally, only alone, no longer the body, no longer the body together, but just him standing, and he is infallible. By the appropriating, through the dogma of infallibility, of all the power and rights belonging solely to Christ the God-man, infallibility only belongs to the God-man, to the body of Christ in counsel with the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the God-man speaking, right? That's the Theanthropos. Now we have this these rights, this ability to be taken away from the body and given to one man. And now he says, without the church, if so so necessary, right? Doesn't matter. Doesn't have to have the he doesn't have the agreement of the rest of the body. He's gonna stand there and be alone, and he's gonna be as a man now infallible. He's gonna have that which belongs only to God, only to the, the theanthropic body, Christ. He is the church, Christ is the church. So all the power which belong exclusively to Christ, the God-man. Now the Pope, a man, has in fact, by this act, proclaimed himself a church within the Papist church and has become all-powerful in it. So he's now a church within the church. He has become his own version of the upholder of all things, right? He now has that given to him. A little bit longer, a more extensive quote by St. Eustine. You have an icon of him here on the left. By the way, today is his feast day. Today, the 14th, the first on the church calendar, is the great uh, the feast of the great uh, theologian. We're very honored to be able to 
honor him in this way today on his feast day. He says, man in general has ultimately been pronounced infallible by the dogma of the infallibility of the Pope. Man. So again, it's not, it's very rationalistic the way that the uh, apologists for, uh, for Catholic answers were looking at it. Very narrow, very realistic, legalistic. This is now a man. This, the implications are grave. It doesn't matter what man. It's a man who now has this infallibility. Hence, there is an infinite number of popes throughout Europe, both in the Vatican and in Protestantism. Uh, this is an old teaching of the Orthodox, that, the, that the, we have two kinds of Protestantism. We have a papal Protestantism and we have a reformed Protestantism. But the Pope is the first Protestant, according to Orthodox theologian. We're going to actually quote one of them. There's no substantial difference between them, for papism was the first Protestantism. According to the words of the truth discerning Komiakov, Alexei Komiakov, he was one of the so-called Slavophile theologians in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, he's actually he's actually uh, referenced in that book by Yves Congar, uh, and he's saying that the critique of the Slavophiles on us is precisely that we had we have lost uh, that which which was in the first millennium, and that uh, that perception, that integral thinking. Uh, and the symbolism and all the rest, he said, and that, he says, this is the criticism that they're making, like somebody like Komikov is making. So Komikov was extremely perceptive, and St. Saint Saint Eustine is quoting him here. Uh, papism was the first Protestantism. Infallibility is a natural theanthropic characteristic and function of the church as the theanthropic body of Christ, whose eternal head is the truth. He is the head, not the Pope, not any bishop. He is the head. It's his body. We are his members. He, together with us, the three anthropic body, is infallible. Right? Whose eternal head is the truth, the supreme, the supreme truth, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Theanthropos, Jesus Christ. By the dogma of infallibility, the Pope was, in fact, proclaimed to be a church. And he, a man, took the place of the God-man. This was the final triumph of humanism. Final triumph of humanism in the West. It was also through the second, though the second death. It was also though the second death. He was talking about. He was referring to the Book of Revelation here, of papism, the spiritual death, and through it of every humanism. But according to the truth, the true Christ, Church of Christ that has existed since the advent of Christ, the Theanthropos, in this world. As his theanthropic body, the dogma of the infallibility of the Pope is not only a heresy, but the ultimate heresy. It's not only heresy, it's the ultimate heresy. No other ecumenistic heresy has so radically and so comprehensively risen against Christ the Theanthropos and his church as papism has through, but the dogma of the infallibility of the Pope, a man, right? So there's nothing like this. This is the extreme extreme in terms of departure from the theanthropic uh, body of Christ. This is un undoubtedly the heresy above all heresies. It is the ho horror, horror above all horrors. It is an unseen rebellion against Christ the God-man. It is, alas, the most dreadful banishment of the Lord Christ from the earth. It is the repeated betrayal of Christ, the repeated crucifixion of the Lord Christ, not on a wooden cross this time, but on the golden cross of papist humanism. All this is hell thrice over for the wretched earthly being called man. I mean, you can't get much powerful than that here. This is one of the... Now, why am I sharing this people who might be interested in Orthodoxy? Maybe some Roman Catholics here tonight and they're interested. What does the Orthodox Church have to say about Catholicism? I'm sharing this because at the heart of the Orthodox Church in the 20th century, this saint holds prime place. And I want you to know that they're not telling you the truth all the time. Online, some of the political figures in the church or the humanists or the, the kind of superficial Orthodox who don't know what they're talking about. This saint is revered throughout the Orthodox church and his wisdom has been embraced by the church. They've declared him a saint and his writings have been translated in many languages. As I showed you here, his uh, dogmatics text has been translated to Greek and now it's being translated into English. 
So this is at the heart, this, this man, this theologian, this saint is expressing the heart of the church, which is the Theantibos. Christ is all in all in the Orthodox Church. It's absurd and a blasphemy to put a man and call him infallible when that infallibility is only when the full Christ, God, man, the God, man is present. And that means his whole body with him at the head. That's, that's the Theanthropic um, nature of the church. It's, it's, so it's a, it's a heresy of heresies for the Orthodox. I'm